Hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in. My name is Linda O'Brien, and I'm the school liaison at an unlikely bookstore in Plainville, Massachusetts. Before we start, I want to thank everyone taking part in this wonderful event for showing support for the author and for our store. As a sideline, big shout out to all the elementary school students in Swanee, Georgia. Just a personal thing, sorry. A couple of housekeeping tips. If you have any issues with this video or audio quality, try refreshing your page. And if that doesn't work, try leaving the presentation and log back using Google Chrome as your browser. Kate's going to answer some questions after a presentation. When it comes time for the Q&A, there's a box at the bottom of your screen where you can write your questions in. Please put the name of your class or the name of the student. I'm seeing a lot of traffic on the chat section. I'm going to lose your questions over there. So use the ask a question box at the bottom. I see there's 26 questions in there already. If you're watching this as part of a school visit and you reached out to me, you can order Kate's book through the web link in your school's informational email. The deadline to place orders through your school is Monday, December 6th. That's next Monday. And we'll ship those books out to your school in about three weeks. Everyone else, you can click on the green button just below me. It says click here to purchase books, follow the instructions, and you can order Kate's books. With that said, I am pleased to announce, or delighted to introduce Kate DiCamillo, beloved storyteller, two-time Newbery medalist. She joins us today to share her newest novel, The Beatrice Prophecy, a medieval fantasy featuring one of the most unforgettable animal cracker characters that she's, that she's ever created, amidst some strong competition, mind you. Anselica is a hard-headed, sharp-toothed goat. Kate's first novel, Because of Win Dixie, was published in 2000 after a young editor spotted it in a slush pile, a publishing house's collection of manuscripts sent unsolicited by aspiring authors. Since then, she's published over 25 novels, including Tale of Despero, which run, won the Newbery Medal in 2004, and Flora and Ulysses, which won that same medal in 2014. And with that said, Welcome, Kate. So glad that you can join us. Let me get you up here. There you are, and there you are. Hi, everybody. It has been so much fun to like, hey, Hagerstown, Maryland. I saw Hold on, I'm gonna refresh here. Yeah. Uh, there, how's that? That's better. Oh, wait a second. Background. Oh. I'm gonna... There we go. How's that? Now, Hi, Kate. You have Crowdcast open twice, probably. Um, so if you see another tab open, you just want to close that out. What? I, I, do, do I? Do I? Um, Crowdcast is probably open more than once on your computer. Sometimes when you log in, it opens a bunch of times. So if you want to just make sure it's oh, only wow. opened in this. Bear with this, guys. Yeah. There's the perfect. Yay! That's better. Yay! Okay. Oh, I'm go sorry for it, Kate. I, and okay. I was talking about Hagerstown, Maryland. I saw your names uh, go by. Um, um, my mom grew up in Keeviesville, and so I just wanted to say um, hello to, to to all of you in Maryland, and hello to everybody all over the country. I think. Um, and I I'm so thrilled to be here with all of you. It's been one of the surprises for me about doing um, these kind of virtual events is that I still get to feel connected to readers and I get to hear from so many um, teachers who read to their uh, students. And so before we do anything else, I want you wherever you are to applaud the person who reads to you every day. And in your classrooms, in your auditoriums, if you're sitting home alone, it is the greatest gift that teachers give to you and librarians do it too and your parents. Um, so thank you to everybody who reads aloud. Okay, so um, just a heads up, Ramona, my dog is here 
and she's named for uh, Ramona Quimby, Ramona the Pest. So um, she could actually make a pest out of herself. I, I'll, I'll try to pull her up um, before our visit is over so she can uh, say hello to all of you. But she really is Ramona the Pest. Um, the Beatrice Prophecy. I don't know, it, maybe some of y'all are reading this in your classroom because Linda said before we started that um, there was a specific request not to give away the ending. I would never give away the ending, but I'll talk a little bit about this book. I'll read to you from this book just a little bit. And then what I would love to do is to have y'all ask me questions because then um, I feel like we're having a conversation and, and it makes me feel connected to you even though you could be thousands of miles away, which is one of the great things also just about story is that connection. Um, uh, it's, it's, so when you read a book and I'm nowhere near you, but still we connect through the book. And to me, that is absolutely miraculous. Okay. So Beatrice, that's Beatrice. This is Anne Swalica, the goat. Beatrice is a girl who can read and write and the time and place when it is against the law for a, a girl to do either one of those things. And when the book opens up, she is um discovered uh by the goat um and she doesn't remember who she is all she knows is her name and uh, that she can read and write and so this is kind of the story of her finding her way in the world and it's finding it through friendship and finding it through stories and um stories have mattered so much to me uh this book is like sometimes when you write a book you don't even know exactly what it's about until you're finished with it and that's what happened with me here because uh, i was a kid who uh, struggled to learn how to read um i was really really fortunate and that uh, my mom read to me all the time took me to the library bought me books but uh, in those days, I'm 57, um, you weren't taught how to read until first grade. And um, so I went off to first grade just hungry to learn how to read. And um, they were teaching with phonics. For whatever reason, phonics made no sense to me. And um, I got kind of, I got hysterical. I remember coming home from school, like crying to my mother because there was this thing that I wanted so much, which was to read. And it was right in front of me, but yet I couldn't grab it. And I said, I don't understand what they're talking about with the upside down letters. And I don't, and I wanna read. And my mother said, cause she was a very pragmatic person. She said, for the love of Pete, calm down. And then she said, okay, this is basically what she thought. Your brain doesn't work that way. Let's figure out the way your brain does work. And what my mother did was she made me flashcards and she put a word on each flashcard, really thick stack of flashcards. And then when I would come home from school, she and I would go through that whole stack and I memorized the words and that's how I learned how to read. And so this book is dedicated to my mother for giving me that gift of story and words and reading and for teaching me that there's not always just one way to do things. Um, and so in this book, when Beatrice makes friends, one of them is a boy named Jack Dory. And uh, she discovers that even though he's the same age as she is, he, he can't read. And she's just kind of appalled by that. And she decides that she's gonna teach him how to read. So that's the chapter that I'm going to read to. It's very short. It's uh, chapter 34. I'm on page 154. This is actually what we call an ARC. Um, it, it's an advanced reading copy. So it's not the final copy. It's the last thing that goes out so you can catch mistakes. And um, so, and I like reading from it because it always reminds me that a book is a uh, work in progress. It's never perfect and it's never really done. Okay, here we go. Chapter 34. Each letter has a shape, Beatrice said, and each letter has a sound. And you put these shapes and sounds together and they become words. Do you understand? I, he said to her, his heart was beating fast. He did not know. He had not understood how much he wanted it to know the secret of letters and sounds and words. But his heart 
pounding against his rib cage was telling him. He and Beatrice were bent together over a piece of parchment and Swellica was leaning over them, staring down at the parchment too. She gave off a tremendous smell of goat. You, said Jack Dory, are in my way. He gave Answellica a small shove. She buttered her forehead against his, shoving him back. Kanek was gone. Where he had gone, they did not know. He was off on whatever mysterious errand a man who had once been king and was king no more might need to attend to. It begins with this, said Beatrice. This is the letter A, and it is the first one. She formed the letter. A, he repeated. He smiled. There are 26 letters in all, she said. You will learn each of them, and once you know them, you can mix them as you will, and then use them to form the words of the world and the things of the world. You can write of everything, what is, and what was, and what might yet be. Jack Dory nodded. The inside of Canuck's tree was smug. There was the smell of beeswax burning, and also, of course, the smell of goat. The bee buzzed around Jack Dory's head. Granny bid speak beside him, saying, learn it, my beloved. Learn it all, light of my heart, river of my soul. A is for Abelard, that is my family name. A is also the letter that begins the name Answellica. The goat let out an approving grunt. The next, the 26 is B. She bent her head and formed the letter. B is the first letter of my name, Beatrice, and from there to C. What word begins with C, asked Jack Dory. Can it, said Beatrice, and when will we get to the Jack Dory letters? Soon, said Beatrice. He watched the letters appear one by one beneath her hand, and he felt as if each letter were a door pushed open inside of him, a door that led to a lighted room. The world, said Beatrice to Jack Dory, can be spelled. And that way, Jack Dory feels that each letter was like a door that led to a lighted room. That's the way it felt to me when my mother was holding up those flashcards. Such a huge privilege and gift to be able to read and to have somebody who reads to you. Okay, Linda, do you want to come back and we'll do questions? Because I was looking at the comments as they were coming by when before y'all were on. And I can see that you've got a lot of books that you're reading and a lot of questions about those books and I want to answer them. Isn't that amazing? I mean, the, the comments just keep on coming in from all, we've had California all the way to the East Coast to Massachusetts, and down to together. Georgia. It's been we're fabulous. Together, yeah. Let's see what some of the questions are here. Um, actually, the first question that came in, were you involved in making the Winn-Dixie movie? That came from Mrs. Diamond's class. Hello, Mrs. Diamond's class. Was I involved in making the Winn Dixie movie? Um, I I was in that I got to um, learn how to write a screenplay. I did not get the screenplay credit for that, but I got to work on the screenplay, which was fascinating and fun. And I got to um, visit the set, which was also just unbelievable. And I arrived on the movie set um, when. Um, I know that there's going to be somebody screaming somewhere the day that Dave Matthews was there. And, um, but that with the scene that they were trying to um, film was when Gertrude the parrot lands on uh, Winn Dixie's head. And um, no one was pleased with me because uh, the parrot didn't want to land on the dog's head and the dog didn't want the parrot on him his head. And so they had been trying to film that all day long. That's that's when I was on the set. It was it was fabulous and fun to get to to watch all of that and to and to see that a book you know, sometimes people will say to me, why is the movie different than the book? And and it's something that I like to talk about because I think almost it's like this is there was actually a science for this about 75% of us when we're reading, we see the book, we see the story in our head. And so we've all got our own personal movies in the head in our heads as we're reading. So what I see is different from what you see. And so a movie is necessarily going to be different than what you're seeing. And also it's a different art form. So whoops, here's Ramona right here. There, you can see her nose. Okay, um, I'm ready for the next question. Lily. Okay, Mrs. Waltrus's class. I thought this was good. Why did you choose to share the chapter that you did? 
Why did I be, ah, it's a very That's a great good question. question. It's a very good question. And it's, um, you know, I have, because of, uh, you know, not doing a lot of public events because of the pandemic, I have mostly done um, virtual events and that is the chapter that I read every time. Why? Because to me, it's it makes me understand where the book came from in my heart, which was that wonder of somebody giving you the power of being able to read and write. And, and it's so much, I think this, this is a book about friendship, but it's also a book about finding yourself through words and, and story. And so in that chapter where somebody teaches somebody else the miracle of it, just, I, I love to read it. So that's a great question. Uh, Deborah Hern Herndey, um, her class is noticing the similarities between Despero and Beatrice. Did you realize that as you were writing it? You know, it's really, uh, this is another great question that nobody has Good thinking asked. going on. Yeah, yeah. Right. And, and this is the thing. It's just like, you know, I, I won't, I don't want to give, I don't want to give any spoilers, um, in Beatrice, but there are moments, um, uh, that to me seem, um, they, they echo some, I, I think, I think it's very true, uh, that there are similarities and the similarities are, uh, even though it's a totally different story, it's me writing it. And my preoccupations seem to be, uh, Ramona, that's enough. Um, <laughs> the power of story and the power of forgiveness and the power of love and the power of friendship. And so those are, those seem to be the themes that I keep coming back to again and again and again. I, I, I remember the very first time when I, I, I my first book was Because of Win Dixie. I was working at a bookstore um, when it came out and, uh, and somebody called and said, will you come and talk to uh, our fifth grade classroom and we'll pay you? And I'm like, wow, really? And so I, I, that was my first school visit. I went and talked to these fifth graders and I remember being so excited um, when I arrived and I stood up in front of the class and I couldn't believe I was gonna get paid for this. And the teacher said, okay, this is the person who wrote the book and now what we're gonna do is talk about the themes in this book. And I remember thinking, oh no, um, they're not gonna pay me because I don't know what the themes are in the book. And then this wonderful teacher, along with these wonderful students, they worked together to put the themes up on the blackboard. They told me what the themes were. And I could see once they pointed them out that they were there. And, and those themes, friendship, forgiveness, love, family, story, those are the same things that I've been working with ever since I, the first book. Um, so, yeah. Okay, I have um, the Happy Campers at East Elementary School in Sharon, Massachusetts, pretty close to where we are. They, the would, like to know if you, uh, they would like to know if you're going to be asking, uh, adding any more books to your Mercy Watson series. One of my, those are my grandchildren's favorites. I, I, I love Mercy so much because, um, you know, when you write a novel, it takes a really, really long time. And um, for me, I never know exactly what's going to happen or how I'm going to get there. And what I love about doing Mercy Watson books is that character is so strong that all I have to do is think of a situation, put her in it, and then I just stand back and watch her uh, write the book. And, and it's funny because a lot of teachers have figured this out um, and they uh, have their kids write Mercy Watson stories and they're fantastic. I, I think one of my favorites was Mercy Watson gets a call from the IRS. That was like, and, and oh, and Mercy Watson um, meets Moby Dick. That was another great one. But like every situation that you think of, you can put the pig in it and it's fun. Um, so will I be doing more? Yes. I can't stop. I can't stop. So yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Who is this from? Um, I can't tell who this is from, but what inspired you to write the book, Louisiana's Day Home? 
Louisiana's way home. Where did that home. come from? Well, the Louisiana, who I'm always happy to talk about and, and who is always happy to be talked about. She's mm -hmm. um, she's quite she's a fantastic uh, character. Um, she showed up when I wrote uh, Rainy Nightingale, and she was one of those characters who kind of like Sistine Bailey and the Tiger Rising. I didn't have any idea that this character was going to show up. And then when she did show up, it's almost like you had to like make sure that she didn't steal the whole show. And so when I finished um, Rainey's story, I thought, well, that's that. And, but then Louisiana uh, kept on bugging me to tell her story and her voice was so strong. And I thought, I don't want to. I, you know, I already, and, and then she was just so insistent. Um, and that was so much fun to write because I got to do it in first person and I got to be Louisiana. And she's just, uh, I, I don't know any character like her. She's, uh, as my mother would have said, a piece of work, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, from Mrs. Huang's class in Needham, Massachusetts wants to know, will there be a Tiger Rising movie? There will be a Tiger Rising movie, um, and it will be very soon. We don't have a date yet, but there will be a movie, and it is a beautiful movie. So stay tuned. Stay tuned. Okay, and I have another Mercy Watson, a couple of Mercy Watson questions. It's from Amy Anderson, and then also from Jennifer, I can't read, really, Dee Bertoni, um, second grade. They want to know, where did you get the idea for Mercy, and do you like to eat toast with lots of butter? Okay, so all my answers, Linda and everybody else, I'll apologize, are so long. But um, okay. this is, uh, I. here's my notebook. I don't go anywhere ever without a notebook. And I was sitting on an airplane because I've learned like I'll hear things or I'll see things or sometimes, and this was one of those times, something strange will just pop into my head. And then I have the notebook and I can write it down. So the strange thing that popped into my head was, a pig with the name Mercy under it. And I thought, oh, that's so funny, a pig named Mercy. And then I, I when I got home, I, I started to write and it's like, okay, she's a pig. She lives with Mr. and Mrs. Watson. They're not pigs. They've kind of lost sight of the fact that she is a pig. And it seemed very funny to me, but it wasn't quite working. It was one of those things where I would pull it out, work on it, think I can't quite throw it away, but yet I can't make it work. And then uh, what happened was I got uh, a brand new car. It was the first brand new car of my life. It was a very exciting moment. And the first day that I had it, I took a friend to the airport and she got into my brand new car with a gigantic piece of toast that had uh, a lot of butter on it. And she started to eat it in my brand new car, spraying <laughs> greasy crumbs everywhere. And I said, can you wait until you get to the airport to like finish your toast. And she kept on eating it. And she also lectured me about toast and how it tasted better if somebody else had made it for you, one of her kids had made it for her, how it should be buttered all the way to the edges, how it should have a lot of butter. By the time I dropped her off at the airport, I knew what was missing in the book about the pig, which is what the, the pig loved above all else, toast with a great deal of butter. And once I had that element, then they just kind of like wrote themselves. And do I love toast with a great deal of butter? Yeah. <laughs> and I love it best when somebody else makes it for me. So yes. I guess the lesson is you can get inspiration from the smallest incidences in your life. Right. You can. And it's all, it's that thing of just being, um, you know, I, I say when I hold the notebook up, it, the notebook is a reminder to me to keep everything open my my eyes and my ears and uh my brain and my heart and and so everything if you write everything's your business is kind of how i feel the world is your business humanity as a uh, you know scrooge uh and the christmas carol marley's ghost says humanity is your business so a couple of technical questions this is uh, two parts mrs laudon's class. I, I apologize if I massacre your names, teachers. And then also Caitlin. Um, what's the hardest book you've ever written? And how do you feel when an editor gives you so many suggestions to edit and rewrite? Uh, so the hardest book I've ever written was Despero. 
because the the first book that I did, like I said, was Because One Dixie, and then the second book was Tiger Rising, and those two books were kind of um, this Southern realistic fiction for the most part. And the response to um, Because of Winn-Dixie was so overwhelming um, that uh, I just wasn't prepared for it. People, people opened their hearts to that book. Um, teachers read it to their uh, uh, classrooms, librarians read it to their students and something miraculous happened, which it was just, it just went into so many hearts. And so as a writer, I kept on thinking, I have to write another book just like that one or else they're not going to love me anymore. And um, you can't write a book that way. And uh, so it, finally, I figured out I was going to have to go in a totally different direction if I was going to survive as a writer. And so um, that was Despero. And, and it was a totally different kind of book. I didn't know if I could do it. It was complicated. It, it, I had to have a big timeline hanging above my desk. And so that was, that was the hardest, the hardest. And, you know, if you're, if you're ever in Minnesota, you can come to the Curlin collection at the University of Minnesota and you can see all the rough drafts that I did on that book and how hard it was. So then do I mind when an editor tells me what to do? Well, I'll tell you the truth. So like my editor on a novel will generally send me a letter that is about 10 single space pages long. And about a page of that will be telling me what I did right. And the rest of it is questions. What if you could this, why not? And I give myself a day after I read that letter to walk around grumbling under my breath saying, if you know so much, why don't you write a novel? And then what I've learned is I take th those, those pages, I spread them out on the floor and I start to think, okay, what if I did this? What if I did that? And every time I get a better, I get a better book. It's like, it's like you're, um, it's like you're, you're in the trenches of a battlefield and somebody comes along and can see there are birds I view. And so it's editors are so incredibly valuable and my editor, there was, it was a wonderful uh, thing a couple of years ago where we did a couple of tour stops together and I would introduce her to a room full of people and um, everybody gave her like a standing ovation <laughs> because it matters so much. Uh, uh, an editor, it, you know, it's just a really wonderful relationship. Her name is Andrea Tompa. So, yeah. Okay. Can we substitute teacher in for editor for all those students out there? because teachers are so invaluable to you students. Um, they're giving you guidance. So a first draft is not the final copy usually. Right, right. And let's just talk about that for a minute about how, you know, because I think that kids think um, because they're kids, they're getting, you know, it's just like, uh, you're making me do it again. Um, but I have to tell you that, that I know so many adults who want to write and are surprised when they sit down and start to actually do it that it doesn't come out right the first time. And, and it's such an important thing to tell yourself that it's not gonna come out right the first time. It doesn't matter if you're the most talented person in the world, it won't. Um, making art of any kind means being willing to make mistakes and uh, writing draft after draft and it's never gonna be perfect um, but, and it's also not going to come out right the first time you sit down to do it. Um, and so, yeah, li listen to your, listen to your teachers, listen to your editor. Mrs. Murphy's third graders want to know if you have a favorite character that you've created. Mrs. Murphy, where, where are you guys? Does it say? Um, I don't know where Mrs. Murphy is. Let me see. Oh, hold on a second. Say. Nope, I can't do okay. that. Well, hi, Mrs. Murphy's third graders. You know, I can never answer that question because the books and the characters in them feel so much like my kids that it's like kind of impossible for me to just pick a favorite. But if you like really insisted, I would probably pick Win dixie because everything that's happened to me as a writer has happened because of that that dog and that girl. Um, it, it's like I said earlier, I did not, I was in no way prepared for how people would open their hearts and it changed my life. 
Um, so I, I followed that dog and, the, and that girl through this golden doorway um, into getting to write books for a living and getting to talk to all of you. So I have another question. Um, you were showing your, your journal that you have. Um, and let's see, the second grade class at St. Stan's in Winona, Minnesota. Well, Winona. Hello, Winona. I'm in I Minneapolis. Like, they would like to know if you recommend writing in your journal every day. Um, I, this is what I like to say about a journal. Um, it, it is just for me, right? And so nobody else needs to see it and it doesn't have to be perfect. And I, this is the book that I take with me everywhere and out into the world and also the book that I use in the afternoon. In the afternoon, I'll let myself read and uh, I'll take notes in this journal about what I'm working on. In the morning, I get up and I write every morning in a, in a journal. And that also is, you know, about everything, um, but about what I'm working on too. And that one I, I, I do every day and I feel better for doing it every day. This one, um, like I keep a running list of uh, ideas at the back of it. I keep uh, character names. I, I keep, it's just like anything that I want to put in it. And, and, and it's just between me and my heart you know nobody else would make any sense out of it um but nobody else um needs to see it either it's just it's a pact between me and my heart i have a, a question from the charles barnum i believe it's an elementary school in rotten connecticut um and they want somebody else and i can't find it over in the chat they wanted to know did you mean to make a connection between rob's mom and opal's mom both who both of whom passed away yeah, see, this is another one of those things that I do inadvertently um, without realizing it when I write. It goes back to that thing about how I keep on working over the same themes. Um, it's, it's not the passing away, all the that, you know, and I don't know, Opal's mother probably was uh, alive somewhere, um, but rather that missing parent thing um, that I keep on coming back to. Um, and I do it unwittingly, which means I do it kind of like behind my own back. And why is that? Um, because, uh, my father, uh, left, uh, the family when I was six years old and it leaves a question, um, at the center uh, that you never really, no one can ever answer it. And, and stories for me, are, are part of how I turn that over and try to answer it for myself. How do you find uh, love in the world um, when you have a missing parent? Um, and uh, it, that's part of what the stories work through, I think. So then I have a couple of questions here. I have a student, Elise. I don't know where Elise is from, but she said you should have a character named Elsa. And then I like it. I like that name. Yeah, that's a great name. And then Shannon Lame's class. I, or I don't know whether it's a class or whatever. She said, how do you come up with the names of your characters? Where did yeah, yeah, Shannon and, and maybe your class or maybe just you, Shannon. Um, you know, writing is so hard for me. Um, and, and there's I always think there's no point in, in uh, saying anything. Otherwise, I, I have to tell the truth. It is very hard. The only thing about it that's easy for me is coming up with the character names. And those, uh, back to the notebook, they just pop into my head and I just make sure that I always have something um, to write them down. I mean, usually when I have the name, um, then uh, I have the person and then I can uh, follow the person through the story. Okay, this, I've seen several comments come through on the chat here, but one of them recently says, thanks for helping my daughter, Kiplin, love to read. She started reading The Miraculous Journey of Edward Tulane, um, and she's being homeschooled in Maine. So thank oh, you so much. Yeah, that's, really that's, that's so, it's like, is that the best? And Linda and I were talking before we went on, because Linda, you used to teach, what, second grade? Second grade. Yeah. And um, what has, ha and this is so moving to me, is like so many of you kids who are listening now, um, you will go on to be parents and you'll and, uh, and maybe some of you will even go on to be teachers and you will remember your teacher reading to you and then you're going to read to somebody else uh, and because i hear about it i was saying to linda in, in signing lines where i have um young teachers come through and say my fourth grade teacher read me this book 
now I'm reading it to my fourth grade class. And that is, wow, like the best feeling in the world. And sometimes when one of those teachers tells me that, uh, depending on how tired I am, I might cry when they say it. And, and, and it makes me tear up to say it now. I wanted to say something about, um, I get a lot of questions and, and I was prepared for this and it hasn't happened yet, but I'm gonna just bring it up anyway, Linda, if that's okay, about where Edward Tulane came from. Okay. Uh, have you seen? Uh, I've seen a couple of questions. I hadn't gotten yeah. to those yet. Um, so I just, I, because I do have a prop for this, you know, oh, anytime okay. I, I do uh, uh, one of these, everybody says, okay, what, where's your presentation? There's no presentation. It's just me talking to y'all. And I don't have a screen share, but I do have um, oh my this, gosh. Yeah, which is, uh, this was a gift, a Christmas gift from a friend. And um, when she handed him to me, I said, what's his name? And she said, Edward. And I said, thank you very much. And I took him home and I put him on the couch in my living room. And then every time I walked into the living room, I like screamed a small scream because he's kind of a creepy looking <laughs> rabbit, right? And um, I thought, golly, I wonder if I'm gonna like have nightmares with this rabbit in the house. And then like, the third night that I had him, I had a dream of where he was uh, underwater, face down on the ocean floor with um, no clothing on, basically. Um, your basic naked rabbit dream. And I thought, oh, wow, okay, I can write a picture book about that. And what happened was that I sat down and started to write and like the story just kind of wrote itself. It was never happened to me before or since. Uh, I did less drafts than I normally do. Um, and it just it just kept on unfolding. The whole thing was a gift. And um, this rabbit is, sits in my office now. And every once in a while, I, I walk past him, <coughs> pat him on the head and say, you have been a very productive rabbit. I mean, it was a great gift and I didn't know it at the time. But that goes to that whole thing about not knowing where the stories come from and just being open to everything. Okay, what other words do I have here? Um, what do you see as the thing that your books have the most in common? That's from Jen Webin, 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 something. And I don't know whether that's a class or whatever. Okay, Jen, hello. What, are, what do I see as my books having in common? I think it's those themes of forgiveness and family and love and uh, friendship and the missing parent. This, and I can't find who did this right now. They, uh, the question was, if you could be famous for something else besides being a children's author, what would that be? Uh, well, uh, a, <laughs> um, I, let me just say this. Um, I wanted to write for so long before I actually sat down and started to do the work of it. And by the time I started to do the work of it, I had worked uh, in the book industry enough to know that I had very realistic expectations for what would happen um, as far as like making a living as a writer. And uh, I thought that maybe I would be able to go down to working 30 hours a week and make, you know, um, you know, the mess, rest of the money from writing. So um, it is the dream that I've had since I was 20 years old, at least. And now I'm 57. And there's nothing else that I want to do. I feel like um, I'm so lucky to have found what I'm supposed to do and to get to do it in this world. That is the biggest gift, bigger than anything. And to have y'all read the books, can you imagine what a gift that is? To, to, for me to find the thing I'm supposed to do and for y'all to like read the words that I write, it's the best thing ever. I just finished a, another middle grade book and it was all about, you know, finding your passion, finding out who you are and what you like to do. It doesn't have to be what your best friend does. It doesn't have to be what mom and dad do or, you know, it, or your teacher wants you to be. It's find your passion. What was that book, Linda? Um, actually, that was um, by Kelly Baptiste. I did a, a an event with her yesterday and the book is called the swag is in the socks and it was a it was a great book about a seventh grader 
and you know finding the confidence to be so yes right that's our job here is to figure yes. out what we're supposed to to be in the world and, and how well, to shout out to kelly thank you wow. <laughs> um, do you have a writing schedule um i uh i write two pages a day when i'm working on the rough draft of a novel and um so my schedule is to get up really early while it's still dark out and um, to, to have a, a coffee maker that goes on automatically to come uh, right downstairs and write before I do anything else, um, before I can talk myself out of it. And, uh, and then when I'm on second drafts, third drafts, fourth drafts, e each draft, I do more sessions a day. But in the beginning, I move very slowly and, um, and it's, it's two pages. And, and I have found that I think this is true of most people, um, that there's a voice in your head that um, never really goes away that says, uh, you don't know what you're doing. This isn't going to work. This isn't any good. You can't do this. this. This, No, no, no. And for me, I have found that that voice gets up at about 8 30, 9 o'clock in the morning. So I get up before that voice that tells me no. Um, and, and I do the work before I start all the doubts come in. You, you need some of the doubts when you're doing a rewrite. You need them when you're um, reading your editorial letter, um, but you don't need them when you're creating. So. Um, Mrs. Salutros, fourth grade class in Easton, Massachusetts, would like to know what's your favorite author for kids? Oh, wow. Again, it's like it's the same as me picking my uh, favorite character from a book. There have been so many different books that have mattered to me for so many different reasons that it's impossible to pick just one author. Um, how about I pick three? Um, I'll, I'll do E.B. White um, oh, because, yes. yeah, I, I didn't read Charlotte's Web when I was a kid. And then, uh, because I was worried about what was going to happen to the pig on the cover of the book. And so I didn't read it until I was 30 years old. Uh, and it's a book that I reread every year thinking, okay, how do you work that magic? Um, Christopher Paul Curtis, mm -hmm. uh, the Watsons go to Birmingham, 1963. Uh, is a book that um, I, I, I was working at a book warehouse and I, I took a copy of that book home and I typed up a chapter trying to figure out how he worked that magic of telling a story that's so important and so funny and so warm. Um, and how about Catherine Patterson, Bridge to Terabithia, which oh, yes. one tells me every time. Yeah. yeah. Um. I think we're going to be closing up pretty soon. I just wanted to ask you, are you working on anything? Should we expect anything in the next year or two? You should expect something um, next fall. So, and um, I, I won't, I won't, I don't know if I can say what it is. Hey, can I show you all a picture of me with my mom when I was a kid before we? Yes, go? absolutely. I just wanna, um, I wanna give her a shout out for. So there's me. There's my mom. And she, we spent so much time in that uh, in that chair. It's called a butterfly chair, and she read to me there. And so, uh, for all of you who have a parent at home who reads to you, or a teacher who reads to you at school, you're very lucky. And it would be great if you could thank them for doing that. That would be a really good thing. All you students go home tonight when mom and dad or whoever's at home with you, you're having dinner, and they say, "Well, what happened at school today?" Well. <laughs> A really great author told us to say thank you for reading to us and thank yes. you for, for taking care of us. And that was really wonderful. Kate, this has been absolutely wonderful. I love being in conversation with you. All you I loved it too. I, I could keep on talking to all of you and there, you know, let's let's also do a shout out for some of the questions that I had never heard before. You know, I've done this a lot. And so it's so interesting to hear people thinking about the stories and talking about the stories and engaging with them. And it's like, I'm so grateful to all of you. Um, mm -hmm. And I, you know, Ramona has gone to the couch now, so I won't, I won't wake her up. Sleeping dogs, let them lie, right? Um, but uh, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for being a reader. And for this has been an absolutely wonderful event. I, this is the largest event that I've done. It's just from, as I said, 
students from all students and classrooms from all over the country and it's wonderful to be able to get everybody together in one virtual place we'd love to see you in person but hopefully next fall we'll see you at an unlikely bookstore in plainville massachusetts I would love that. we can do another virtual event like this and invite the whole world um, and thank you teachers students classrooms individuals who logged on to our crowdcast presentation today we really appreciate your support for our store and especially for Kate. Um, remember, orders are due for um, schools next Monday, um, December 6th. Great read aloud books for your classrooms. Great read aloud books um, at home. Read them yourself. And for now, I'm going to say goodbye and keep reading. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Linda, for, for fielding all the questions. Okay, Great. bye.